In this podcast episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with the Meat Mafia podcast. Brett shares about his experience with ulcerative colitis, how he was on pharmaceutical drugs, but ended up getting off everything on a carnivore diet. And now that his gut health and his IBD, as well as ulcerative colitis is in remission, he is now giving back and serving the community. Harry also shares his story about just having a little bit of hormonal acne and being affected by taking Accutane and what carnivore has also done for his healing journey. They both share about how they have healed so much on a wellness journey, including especially with diet and a meat-based diet and what other tools they use to improve their lives. We talk about finances. We talk about the types of meat. We talk about what really is important in a lot of these discussions that we should be sharing more openly. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and that often starts with the carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. I'm excited for you guys to listen to this podcast and get to know a little bit more about Brett and Harry who are the masterminds behind the meat mafia podcast and media agency. It's such a good discussion. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did. Hey guys, I'm so excited to have the Meat Mafia on our podcast. We've, you know, rescheduled a lot of times, but I'm finally glad I get to sit down with you guys. I'm so excited for you to share your journey. And before we get started, I did want to say, and I wanted to say this offline, but I was like, I'll just wait till we record. I just wanted to give you guys kudos for, I think you guys have a skill of connecting people because I have interviewed several people since uh, just chatting with you guys offline and your name, your brand comes up often of the stellar work you're doing, the connection, even the support for marketing and getting companies more known. I I just wanted to commend you. I read, I think it was a tipping point from Malcolm Gladwell and he talked Mm -hmm. about different characters or roles. And I think you guys are the connector and I just wanted to applaud you. But that all said, if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Yeah, thank you for saying that number one. And for your audience, you've had a huge impact on both Harry and myself particularly with the journey around nutrition that we've been on for the last five or six years. And I think part of why we love connecting people, like you said, Judy, is I think we all have a role to play and we'll get into it. I mean, carnivore and animal products has changed both of our lives. It's kind of filled us with a different level of energy, vitality. I think in some ways it's helped us find God and shape our journey with Christianity. So it's so easy for us to make the connections because every time we try and connect the right people, it's from our, we're coming at it from the perspective of we can just make this movement grow more and more and help people get healthier. So that's that's ultimately what what we love to do. But for anyone that doesn't know us, Judy, so I'm Brett. This is Harry. Uh, we run the Meat Mafia podcast. So we're local to Austin, just like you are. Um, and we've been going at this thing for about two years now, really just trying to address some of the fundamental issues that have gone wrong with our food system the last 50 years and really promote animal products and keep things very simple for people and drive education to those foods because we really feel like they're unjustly demonized. And if we put out the right information, more people can gravitate towards those foods and really achieve the optimal health and life that they deserve. So we're really focused. We do about two podcast episodes a week. We're about 260 episodes deep into the show. Um, And then we also have a supplement company called Noble Origins, which is a beef-based protein powder. So trying to combine a lot of the ingredients that helped us achieve optimal health in powdered form. Yeah. So I'm Harry, the other half of the meat mafia. And uh, I think the only thing I could say to expand on kind of how Brett introduced us was, you know, Brett and I met in college and we unfortunately didn't overlap for too long. We only had about a year together, um, but immediately we had this friendship based around health and the years following both of us kind of ran into different health problems. We can dive into it deeper too, but you know, Brett had ulcerative colitis, which he cured through an animal based carnivore diet. And then I was just kind of running into the, the very like standard status quo issue of like getting a desk job and then starting to see my athletic background start to turn into, you know, something that was very much not athletic. So I was starting to lose that edge a little bit and, you know, I start eating right and I start to see my health come back and my vitality come back. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can do so much more um, with my time just because I started getting healthier. And it was like that little bit of momentum around improving my diet has totally changed my life and, and Brett's life as well. So we're just really excited to be a part of this community of people that actually cares about you know the direction of where things are going. And I think you know you mentioned at the beginning, like us playing this connector role, 
like there's so much momentum going in the other direction in terms of people getting healthier. And Brett and I talk about this all the time. Like we're like the we're we're trying to push back against a system that's essentially set up for people to become unhealthy. So we just really think that the solutions are relatively simple. Like the the answers lie in eating really high quality real food. And then, you know, you know, there's just a lot of noise in the space. So how can we just be a place, you know, we're not the PhDs, not the doctors, not the, the nutritionists, not the farmers, like how can we play a role here? And I think our role really is kind of trying to be the voice and the connectors and bring this movement a little bit more of a cohesion that, you know, there's a little bit more of a spark to it. So we just get really excited being able to connect with people like yourself. And Judy, I wanted to give you a shout out. I was talking to Brett the other day, your book that just came out, the the complete, is it the complete beginner's guide to carnivore diet? Yes. yes. It, I was like, there's nothing else that needs to be added. This is oh, it. This you. is this is like the perfect way to introduce people to eating a carnivore diet. And I was like, there's nothing that's not in here. It's the perfect place to start. It'll be the resource that I send to all my friends who are interested in eating healthier. So it, I just wanted to say that because it, it was such a good read. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm not, not going to delve into my stuff. I want to, you know, continue. <laughs> about, I appreciate it so much. You guys are always so kind. Brett, let me talk about your story first. So, you know, you were in a, we, on your podcast, we talked about you had a successful career and, you know, you were going to climb the corporate ladder. And then I guess your illness took a precedent in a sense. And then you had to just find the right answers. And that's how you sort of landed here. Can you walk us through that journey? Definitely. Yeah. And I, and I love episodes like this because I think I'm always amazed at how many DMS I get of people that are struggling with yeah. IBS, Crohn's colitis, autoimmunity, and they're just so desperate to seek those answers. I think that's partially why there's a big swing of people that try veganism or raw veganism and then end up going carnivore because they're willing to do whatever it takes to really get the health outcomes that they're looking for. And I was in that similar camp. So, you know, as Harry mentioned, we both played college baseball together. I went to Babson college, which is a small school up in Boston graduated in 2017. And I really justified the fact that I was healthy because I was a high level athlete. And, you know, I had muscle, I worked out, I thought I, I, I trained hard and I thought I was doing the right things. But there were a number of things that I was doing in my early 20s that I think led to me getting as sick as I was. So, you know, number one, in college, I was consuming a ton of processed foods. I didn't know how to cook anything. I was eating out all the time. I was binge drinking on the weekends as well. I was honestly chronically stressed out because of baseball. It was the first period in my life where I kind of doubted myself and my own confidence. And I went from having really fun and competing to being having this really strong fear of failure where I would actually like get sick before games. So I think it was a combination of those lifestyle factors over a course of like five plus years that really led to me getting sick. So everything started changing in 2016 when I had my first internship at a financial services company in New Jersey. I started noticing I was having blood in my stool and then urgency to go to the bathroom. So I think number one, if anyone is starting to experience those symptoms, you should definitely go to your GI because you do not want to let that progress. Okay. I was about 21 years old and I don't know if I was naive or I thought I was invincible, but I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to ignore it. It'll get better on its own. And then the course of that summer of my internship, the symptoms got continued to get worse and worse, like more blood in the stool, more urgency to go to the bathroom. I couldn't hold down any food and I was just like losing weight and getting skinnier and skinnier. So over the course of three months, I went from 185 pounds to about 150 pounds in three wow. months. Um, I was going to the bathroom literally 30 times a day, straight blood, ended up getting rushed to the hospital the last day of my internship. So they performed a colonoscopy and then I got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And then for anyone that doesn't know, that's a, that's a version of IBD. Um, it's an autoimmune disease. So the doctors immediately told me that it was incurable. It probably had nothing to do with diet and lifestyle and that I was going to have to be on biologic drugs for the rest of my life. So immediately upon getting to the hospital, they put me on a really high dose of prednisone. And then they also put me on Remicade, which is a version of a biologic drug. And then I was told that I was going to have to get those Remicade infusions every eight weeks just to put this thing into remission, because that was ultimately the best that they that I was going to get. There was never going to be a cure for UC. Um, so those infusions were about $60,000 per infusion covered by insurance. And I was getting them every eight weeks. Wow. So for my full stint on Remicade, I actually cost the healthcare system $2.4 million, which is astonishing to think about when you extrapolate that amongst all the other people that are on 
Remicade for Crohn's colitis, various autoimmune diseases that vastly didn't exist 50 to 100 years ago. So I will say though, I was so inflamed that I actually needed some type of a drug, I think, to get me out of that flared up state that I was in. And then everything changed for me in 2019. And the reason why I say that is, so 2019, I was about 23, 24 years old. I was living in New York City and I lived with a buddy that was big into bodybuilding. So he was cooking a lot of his own meals and very basic stuff like chicken breast, ground beef, steak, et cetera. And I started noticing that when he was teaching me how to cook some of these meals and I was making them for myself, my stomach actually felt really good. I, I wasn't still going to the bathroom 30 times a day, but it was still probably like four to five, which is more than an average person should be. And I just felt some general inflammation and gut discomfort. And then I stumbled upon Joe Rogan interviewing Sean Baker and the, the podcast took place in 2017, but I came across it in 2019. And Sean was saying that he had seen a lot of patients that were struggling with IBD that are effectively curing this diet through a carnivore, through a carnivore approach. And so for me, I'm 24 years old. My life revolves around this, getting this infusion every eight weeks. I feel good, but not great. So from my perspective was why not try this for a week? Best case, it works really well. Maybe I could actually heal this thing. And then worst case, I just go back to what I was doing and I just stay dependent on the drugs and medication. But that interview gave me a proof of concept that I actually could heal. And it actually triggered a mental shift that maybe there was hope for me. And I think that's a huge point for people to think about because you can do everything under the sun. But I think there is this, and there's almost like spiritual component of actually believing that you're capable of healing um, I know, Judy, that's very close to home for you with some of your story that, that you recapped on our podcast. But so I literally did the diet for a week, steak, chicken thighs, eggs, a little bit of fish, but primarily red meat and fatty cuts of steak, a, a lot of ribeyes, a lot of butter, a lot of beef tallow. Um, and then I was just drinking water and I was doing some coffee too. So I wasn't pure carnivore. And literally within three to five days, I was down to going to the bathroom like one to two times a day. I always had this kind of like burning inflammation in your gut and anyone that's experienced that knows exactly what I'm talking about. That feeling was literally gone within a few days. Not only that, my energy was amazing. I was popping out of bed to go to the gym. I was putting muscle on and my mind just felt so clear. There was no anxiety. There was no depression. I never really suffered from that stuff, but I just noticed the way that I was processing problems was way better. And so like anything else, I just went all in on that diet for a year where I was like 99% strict carnivore with a little bit of coffee and it completely transformed my health. And I ended up going back to my doctor, my GI in 2021 for another colonoscopy because I felt like I was capable of getting off of those drugs and I was pushing him to get me off of the Remicade. And not only did I not have any cases of inflammation in my stomach, I had zero microinflammation too. So I've been completely drug free for over two years and I'm only patient that my doctor has ever gotten off of a biologic drug. So the point of me sharing that long-winded story was I was about as sick as you could get from an autoimmune perspective and completely reclaim my health through this diet. And that's what makes us so passionate about it is it completely transformed my life and the, the entire person that I am now. Wow. That's such a powerful story. So you had no hits of inflammation since getting off the medication or anything like that? No, the only thing that I will say to be fair is I've had two mini flare ups. Mm -hmm. Both of those flare ups came when I was getting away from the diet, when I was traveling a lot, a little bit more processed food. So when I say I'm cured, if I stick to this diet, my stomach feels amazing. When I start to drift away from the things that help me heal, that's when I start to notice those symptoms come back. And anytime I start to notice inflammation or more urgency to go to the bathroom, red meat, salt, bone broth, water, nothing else, pretty much a lion diet. And it takes care of it within like a few days max. Your story is so powerful. And I was just curious. So when you got on the biologics and you first were diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, did you change your diet in between before moving to carnivore? I did not, to be honest with you. I think that my thought process was I was just doing what the doctor was telling me. And I know that the drugs were working. And I also think there was probably some placebo component too of being like, all right, I'm on a drug that's supposed to keep me in remission. And I did focus on working out and getting good quality sleep. So I think those things started to have some impact. And then when I was living with my friend that was cooking a lot of like animal based meals, I, I unintentionally was kind of going carnivore, but didn't put the connection together of, Hey, these foods actually make, make my stomach feel really good. And then it was that intentional shift after listening to Dr. Baker, that that's really what changed everything for me. Yeah. That's so powerful. It's so ironic because most people say that we need to eat fiber 
because of our gut function and gut health. But I think one of the number one things that people say is a benefit across the board on a carnivore diet, obviously blood sugar balances improve and stuff, but it's a gut. I feel like the number one thing is my gut feels better. I know people still have regulation issues where maybe they'll have more loose stools and maybe they have to mess with the macros digestive supports, but generally speaking, you don't feel the bloat. You don't have the gas. You don't have a lot of that stuff that even the general public, which is not just because it's common doesn't mean it should be normal, but that they're they'll feel. That's something we talk about all the time. Oh, okay. And even- even, and this is, this is anecdotally, but I have a lot of friends that have now from back home that have now heard my story and they'll kind of ask me about like a playbook or a blueprint of how to get started. And I've had dozens, if not more friends reach out to me and say that, you know, Hey, I have issues going to the bathroom or I have get all this gas and bloating. And they probably, I honestly think a lot of them have undiagnosed IBS. Okay. So I, I sometimes just wonder how much of the pop, the U S population has undiagnosed IBS. And to your point, we have normalized things that have that should not be normalized. Like most people are accustomed to, you know, eating, you know, eating a few slices of pizza at lunch in between office breaks and feeling like they're going to pass out under their desk or feeling like they have to go to the bathroom. And that's the amazing thing about carnivores. You develop this amazing intuition and it allows your body to just feel amazing in this heightened state and realize like you're, you just feel like you're digesting and absorbing everything so well and none of it's going to waste. And I, I sometimes think about, you know, what could the productivity of the population look like if we were just eating nutrient dense foods? Like how much potential are we actually leaving on the table? Because we're not, we're not informed about what the right foods are that we should be eating. Yeah, I completely agree. I think if that's been part of my mission, now that I have children, it's not just about me healing, I need to help the next generation eat meat. Because even if my kids are the healthiest, who are they going to hang out with? Who are they going to have children with? Right. So it's, it's beyond just our, our little small circle. It has to go a lot more mainstream, a lot more people eating meat because you're right. I mean, we are losing a lot of productivity costs in medical care and stuff. Yeah. So I would say, so similar to Brad, I had an early encounter with the pharmaceutical medical system. When I was in high school, I was had pretty bad cystic acne and chose to use Accutane to address the problem. Like I was just looking for any solution to fix the problem. And I didn't actually have any guidance in in terms of someone saying, Hey, why don't you try changing your diet? And looking back, it's like one of the biggest regrets that I have where, you know, during that time period, you know, there's a lot of, you know, that's a very important developmental time period. And I, I think that when I look at my diet back then I was eating nachos at lunch, sugary chocolate milks, like sandwiches. And it was like this very clear nutrition and diet problem that I just chose to fix with a pill. And so for me, you know, I was lifelong athlete, grew up really focusing, spending most of my time in the gym, not really focusing too much on nutrition in high school and college, really got my nutrition dialed in, started focusing on a paleo diet and saw my performance really improve when it came to baseball, um, which is what Brett and I played. And you know, once I kind of had that light bulb moment of like, oh, wow, like nu- nutrition plays a huge factor in, in not just like being a normal, healthy person, like you can actually optimize and really improve your quality of life by eating the right foods. And I saw like what my friends were doing around me, like I really wasn't participating in drinking all that much during that time. And they were all like drinking a bunch, eating crappy food. And I was on the other end of the spectrum, like eating a paleo diet and going to the gym and really like focusing on my health, I saw, I saw the benefits of it. And then fast forward a few years and, you know, I I entered the working world and started to really get away from those basic principles of eating really high quality foods and spending time in the gym. I was working a corporate job and working long hours and just kind of like really just like wasn't prioritizing my health. And so within the first handful of years after school, I had, you know, put on a little bit of weight, wasn't feeling great, a little bit of low energy and um, looked to to diet and lifestyle to fix it. And so I just kind of like took it under my own power when, uh, when COVID hit to start tinkering with diet and lifestyle again. So I got two hours of my time back in terms of my commute. I was commuting an hour each way, was able to get a little bit of extra sleep, was going for these long walks, was walking like thousands of more steps than I was when I was, you know, working my corporate job and just kind of sitting at the cube all day was getting more sunlight was simplifying my workout routine. So I was just doing the basics like push-ups, pull-ups, really like nothing, nothing too crazy. And within a month I had just, I had dropped 20 pounds. I was feeling great. And it was just like this return back to optimal health. And 
what I was eating at that time was a, a carnivore diet. And so I was just feeling incredible. And at the t same time, Brett was really going on this, a similar journey in terms of healing. And we, we reconnected and um, just had similar sentiments around the diet. Like this is the most powerful tool in the tool belt in terms of improving your, your quality of life is treating diet very seriously and uh, caring about the foods that you put into your body. So that was, that, that was kind of my story is just like really more of like a lifestyle shift and not, not like uh, anything that was predicated on serious health concerns. So, you know, I hope like with my story that, you know, the average person who's maybe struggling with making a, a change or feeling a bit stuck and, you know, they're not really happy with where they're at physically, like you can make those changes and, you know, one to two weeks, you'll see a little bit of change one to two months, you could be a totally different person. So yeah. A lot of people will think, oh, I, I don't need to do these crazy diet shifts or crazy changes in nutrition and lifestyle unless I'm really sick, because otherwise then I don't need it. And it's not true because I think we normalize again, a lot of the fatigue we feel, why do we feel tired after work? And why do we feel like we need to grab a drink after work? And why do we have to decompress that way? Or we need a glass of wine to go to bed. And I think it's that we normalize a lot of these things that we shouldn't be feeling and we think you only do these elimination diets if you're sick or if you're fixing something. But in reality, I think everyone has some ailment. And like Brett said, initially, we aren't living to our potentials because we don't even know what our potential is until we shift. I think if someone is not happy in their life, there's something that's causing that. And I think people can start with nutrition just to get that energy. So you guys have interviewed so many people. I know it's more than just nutrition, but you focus on regenerative agriculture. What have you learned in the, of all your interviews or even just your own experiences, what helps people stick to this way when there's such a big why, right? Of emotionally, physically feeling better, but it's still sometimes not enough to make people stick to this way of eating. It's a, it's such a good, it's such a amazing and difficult question. I know. And it's also something that I've struggled with before too, just to be totally transparent for the audience. It's like, I've had phases of my life where I've been as strict and as motivated as possible. And I've also had phases where I go back home and see my parents in the Northeast and my girlfriend. And I want to, you know, I want to have some pizza when I'm back home. And I, you know, it's like, I, I think it's just going to be a few slices. And then it turns into like four days of poor eating. And for me, it always just comes back to like something that helps me a lot is I I do, I meditate and I pray a lot. And I, what works for me is every single day, actually actualizing this, this future version of Brett that maybe could exist that doesn't exist yet, that is actually able to come by me eating the right foods. Mm -hmm. And I also will meditate on how good I actually feel when I continue to nourish my body primarily with like red fatty cuts of meat and, and foods that are approved on this diet list. And I focus on how good I feel, the fact that I will lose body fat, I'll gain muscle, I'll have more mental clarity, it'll allow me to be better at my job so I can be a better business partner to Harry, be a better boyfriend to my to my girl to my girlfriend Dana. And I focus on a lot of those changes that will come from very simply taking autonomy over the food that I put in my system. But that's a that's the tough thing is that everyone has a different motivational focal point. It's like maybe for Judy, it's sticking to these foods so you can be the best mom to your kids and wife to your husband that you could possibly be. And I think you have to do some deep work, whether it's through journaling or meditation or prayer and thinking about like, what are those things that motivate you the most? And then connecting the dots that it sounds silly, but nutrition is the gateway to be able to achieve that higher version of yourself. And that's one of the pushbacks that we've gotten a lot from, from friends is, you know, how do you continue to just buy a lot of your food from regenerative farms and get get cuts of steak from Whole Foods and things like that? Isn't that super expensive? And number one, we don't think it's more expensive and we can go into why we don't think it's more expensive. But secondly, even if it was, this is like a holistic asset that's going to allow you to achieve a level of potential that you never even thought possible. Like if I have more energy to do my job, that could literally put hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars into our own personal pockets over time. And then you have the priceless investments of like, all right, well, what if I have more energy when I'm a grandpa to be able to pay, to be able to play with my kids or just have more energy to play catch with my son when he gets home from school in the future? Like now we're talking priceless investments too. So I think doing that deep work and really reflecting on the person that you could become stems from taking control, number one, of the food you put in your system. And there's so many good things that will flow from that. And that's really what keeps me going when I want to go off track with my diet. Also having inventory of the type of person that you are because I'm guessing there are probably some people in your community that I think are outliers that could have a P. Terry's burger or have a couple slices of pizza and then bounce right back the next day. 
But I think more people fall into the camp of they get the sugar hit, they get some carbs, they get some grains. And the next thing you know, it's two weeks later. And they're like, how did I get to this point? So I also think you need to know who you are. Brett and I also, we recorded a podcast last week on this called How to Eat Healthy. And so one of the things we talked about first was just this emotional aspect that I think a lot of nutritionists don't necessarily touch, like press into. Like, it's so easy to just say like, eat this, not that. The hard part is identifying the triggers where people are slipping up emotionally. And there's an interesting statistic, 49% of people are, are, are participating in emotional eating on a weekly basis. So that means when they get stressed, they go to food to fix the stress problem or to cope with the stress problem. When they get tired, when they get anxious, when they have a fight with somebody at work or they get stuck in traffic, they're thinking about food as opposed to as their as their coping mechanism, as opposed to maybe exercise or something else. But the reason I think it's really important is a lot of times we get stuck in these patterns without having the ability to self-diagnose. And if you don't remove yourself kind of from your patterns around what you're doing with food and kind of how, how like when you do have an emotional trigger, like you really need to take inventory of the fact that a lot of people are dealing with food as like a coping mechanism in the same way that they would deal with like maybe an alcohol problem or a drug problem. You know, they're going to a bag of potato chips or they're going to a soda or ice cream or pizza. And I think where a lot of people run into issues is they set this pattern habit for themselves at a very early age and then they never come back to it. So even when they do start to have a little bit bit of success temporarily in the realm of fixing some of these, these patterns around food, they're always, they always have that, that nature baked into them. So they're not cognizant of the fact that, Hey, when I do get stressed, I feel this need to go like get a milkshake or whatever it is. So I think there's some more work that needs to be done in the realm of nutrition where it's not just like, Hey, eat, eat X, not Y it's you're choosing to eat Y because you are running into these emotional triggers that are making you want to do that. And now nowadays food is designed, it's engineered. It's engineered to make people want to uh, eat more and there are empty calories left and right in a lot of packaged foods, but they still get the, t- the same effect on their tongue that makes them want to continue to eat more and more of it. So, you know, I think what with all that said, there's just this really important audit that people kind of need to like take a pause on and just really dissect how, how their relationship is with food. See, I, had an eating disorder. And that was such a big struggle. I thought it was just, I'm just using it for weight management, but it wasn't as I went through therapy. It's I use it to regulate my emotions. If I didn't do something, I'll use it. If I celebrate, I use it. And, and so then now as we have our own practice and a lot of people are actually not really coming to us for eating disorders, but Hey, I have rheumatoid arthritis. I just need to fine tune the carnivore diet. And so much of our time after the first session of teaching macros, types of meats, et cetera, meal times, it becomes a lot of therapy of, well, why did you want that certain food when you know it doesn't make you feel well? And we use a lot of food and mood journals to have them realize I turn to that food every time I feel X and they don't realize it until we really hyper focus on the actions that we're doing. And when you notate, you start seeing trends. And so I think everything you guys said is very, very valid. We see that struggle all the time. I hear people will say, yes, you can go to your local farmer, which I do. Uh, We bought a whole hog, we bought steers and quarter steers. And they'll say, but you didn't get to pick the meat you want. You have to get a lot of the cuts that you don't want. Sometimes it's leaner. So is it really a money savings thing? And you have to eat meat that you don't necessarily enjoy. So maybe if you guys can speak and combat that. Yeah, I, I think there's a few a few ways to look at it. And, I, and I'll talk about like my own personal story. It's like when I started ordering meat in a more intentional way, like as in going from going to the supermarket to get my food, going to Whole Foods to ordering directly from a co-op program, you know, I think it's important to understand that there's a scale and, you know, there's still plenty of positive benefits of just like starting off. If you're just early on, like going to the store and getting high quality beef there. The problem is like, as you go further up that scale, you're running into some of these more lifestyle inconveniences and cost inconveniences that I think people who are early on don't necessarily see as, Hey, I'm, this is like an investment. I'm investing in my health long-term. So it takes, I think it takes a lot for people to get to that point. Like you, re- you really need to be 
in it to win it, for lack of a better term, to, to be the type of person who's going to order a quarter cow and say, I'm going to order 120 pounds of beef and I'm going to spend $10 a pound on that beef and I'm not going to get exactly what I want, but I'm going to learn what it means to eat a species appropriate diet and eat nose to tail and have to figure out, okay, what do I do with the bones? Should I make some bone broth? Okay. I learned how to make bone broth. Um, okay. I've got a lot of ground beef. I'm gonna have to learn a few ground beef recipes. And I, I just think it's a, it's kind of just so like, I don't want to be dismissive, but it's just a bit of social programming around like these conveniences that we have in our, in our life. And if you really want to take autonomy of your health, I think there are certain conveniences that you like sort of have to let go of in a way. And when it comes to the cost side of things, you now I said the word investment, we as Americans for decades and decades and decades have allocated 30% of our budgets to healthcare costs and food. And for the longest time, 20% of that 30 was allocated towards food and the, the remaining 10% was healthcare costs and that's inverse. So now we're spending more on healthcare costs and less on food, which isn't a surprise to anyone who's paying attention. It's like our food quality has gone down and therefore that's making people sick and unhealthy. And so we just view this as like the same amount of money that's going towards the same bucket, which is supporting sustenance and making us healthy. So therefore, like if we're spending that money in the right ways, we're not going to like, in theory, have to spend as much on medical bills and, and all that. So, you know, in our eyes, this is the worth, this is the type of thing that you prioritize second after like a roof over your head, like the food that's on your table is incredibly important. Realizing that, you know, it's challenging, like the information barriers and the cost to get this, this stuff, this high quality food is tough, but it's worth it. So yeah, I think that would be yeah, my message. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, I was to be honest too, I don't know if I actually technically eat meat in the most sustainable way, to be honest with you. And what I mean by that is when I actually started keeping a food journal to your point, Judy, which I think is such an amazing tool, I kept kind of like an autoimmune food journal. So I would keep track of what I was eating, what time, what were my energy levels like throughout the day? And then also like, when was I going to the bathroom? That was really important for me. And what I was finding was that when I would eat more ground beef, my stomach would not digest it super well. I actually did much better with the fatty cuts of steak. So I pro I eat primarily fatty cuts of steak and there would be a certain camp of people in the regenerative movement would say that that's not sustainable, but that's personally what works best for me. So I'm going to continue to do something where I'm still trying to source it from the best farm that I possibly can that is doing things regeneratively, you know, rotationally grazing the animals, all that kind of stuff but realizing that I'm going to optimize for the cuts that make me feel my best because that's where I get the most bang for my buck. And I think also too, when I was healing, I was 24 years old. I did not have that much of a budget for food. I was buying the cheap fatty cuts of meat in the outer aisle of the grocery store in New York City. And guess what? I did that for a year because that's all I could afford and that still healed my stomach. Okay. So I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and there's a lot of pressure that people are under feeling like, Oh, if you're immediately not buying from a regenerative grass finished farm, you're doing things the wrong way. And I, I honestly think that's the wrong message. I think there's a progression to a lot of this stuff where I think the first progression is like taking inventory over the macronutrients and the, the foods you're putting into your body at the outer aisle of the grocery store. And then that second step is like, once you start to feel really good, starting to go out there meet some of your local ranchers, learn a little bit more about the food system. And if your budget allows for you to prioritize the regenerative grass finished animal, I think that that's always preferred, but you also have to do what's best for your budget. So I think where Harry and I are at is that we personally feel our best when it is from a local farm source, but also real life gets into the way. And sometimes I'm going to go to Whole Foods or the local grocery store in a pinch and I'm going to buy meat from there and I'm still going to feel really good too. Judy, we had these ranchers on called Holy Cow Beef. They're actually out of Lubbock, Texas. They're amazing people. And um, their head rancher actually had a stroke in his 40s, went carnivore and basically reversed all those symptoms. And they talk about the good, better, best model for beef, which I think is really good for a lot of people where good is just eating meat in general, regardless of where you're sourcing it from. It's still better than the 47,000 products that are found in the, the inner aisle of the grocery store that aren't actual food. Good is buying it from like a grass finished farm that's actually feeding cows grass the entirety of its life. And then best is that local farm that's incorporating, you know, regenerative practices that are also regenerating the land and the community, et cetera. But we think that all meat is good and there's different levels that you can kind of explore there, but take the pressure off yourself and just start by incorporating the right foods and eating them for a long enough time horizon. And you'll, you'll get to where you need to be.
Yeah, I love that message. I went carnivore from plant based. So if somebody said, and you have to do this, and you have to buy a whole steer or a quarter steer, it would have been so complex. And I just needed to get some meat in my system. And yes. and I healed with just meat. But as I got into wellness and understood the nutrition and even raising a cow properly, it's just it's a natural progression. As you said, I want to help the local farmers, I know they don't have a ton of money. And I want to support them. And sure, I don't mind eating a few extra cuts that are not my favorite, because I can tolerate it. And that's just I think being better, you know, stewards of this land and the people and the money part also does come to play. So my son doesn't eat fully carnivore, he eats very, very meat based, but still they'll still have stuff because they're kids. And and so the other day he was coughing a lot ever since having COVID, he would never got really rid of this cough. We finally went to a pulmonologist and they don't know what's wrong with him. There, nothing came out remarkable. And so they want him to be on this preventative spray. And so I just called the pharmacy to, and I'm not going to give it, but I was just curious, what is the cost of this spray? And for one month of him just to have preventative is $170 for a month. And, and we try to use good RX and all the different shenanigans that you could get discounted. That was the cheapest without any of that. It's 250. Obviously we're not going to get it. We're going to go stricter on his diet and see if that will help. But I know the, you know, typical mom will just buy that med because they want their son to stop coughing. And what about the cost of that? And that's just one. They also wanted him to get on albuterol for the bigger costs and then other pumps. And, and it's just, and that's just the start of the medication. And my son is seven. So can you imagine if he was constantly on that? We have people in our practice with autoimmune, they have to buy the grass fed, grass finished, um, unaged as best as possible and eat it from the freezer because that is the only way they can thrive. So it's, it's this conversation that needs to be had, but it's not all grain fed is bad. All grass finished is good or it doesn't taste good. It's find that balance that makes sense. But for everyone, it'll be different. And we have to think about the investment today, because if I didn't know better, my old self would have absolutely put Aiden on that medication. And who knows how his health would be in 10, 15 years of being on these steroids. Definitely. And were we get encouraged because you kind of alluded to this earlier, Judy is like, what are some of the things that you've learned from like the 270 episodes that you've done? I think a lot of the guests just give us hope for the future. So you made me think of this. We had this one guest on her name's Dr. Nasli Latefi. She's the founder of this company called BioVanta. So they make immune, they make throat spray and then lozenges too. And they're scientists and PhDs by trade, but they also have this interest in holistic health as well. So they use things like wintergreen oil, aloe vera, et cetera, all natural ingredients. But then they're actually doing the scientific studies to prove that these drugs are more effective than conventional over-the-counter like cold and flu drugs and medications. And that's super encouraging where you see someone with this blend of like traditional science, but also holistic preventative medicine too. And they're kind of combining these things in a beautiful way where it's like, you know, now if your son gets sick or something like that, I'm not saying this is his his exact use case, but at least you have some natural options to consider where it's like, you can take a spray, but it's six ingredients that are all natural versus like a cocktail of 25 different synthetic ingredients that you don't know ultimately what they're going to do to him over the long course of time. So we just get hopeful that there are more and more brands that are out there and more and more people that are just trying to promote this message to give you as a parent optionality for your kid. No, I love that. I didn't even think of the natural versions. I just thought, oh, I need to get stricter on the diet. That was immediately what happened. But if you can give some advice, maybe share how you eat in a day. If you're if you're a stricter carnivore, do you eat multiple meals a day, one meal a day? Do you eat mostly the fatty cuts of meat? Do you feel better, lean, higher fat? If you could share what you guys eat. Yeah, I'm so year round, I'm probably like 95, 99. 90 to 95% of my calories are coming from some meat-based source, animal-based source. And then I'll mix in a little bit of fruit and honey or raw milk. So on a on a day-to-day basis, I usually am not eating a big breakfast. I get up early, I do a workout, and through about like lunchtime, early afternoon, I probably haven't really had any sort of calories. And then I'll have like a pound of ground beef, um, mix in some eggs, mix in some cheese, and that'll be my first meal of the day. And I try to consolidate most of my calories in like a five, six hour window. It just works best for me. Like the way I operate is like, I just want as few like mood disruptors. And I think eating can like dis- disrupt like 
a lot of like focus and mental energy that I, I'm trying to put into like my big tasks for the day, which I usually try to get done in the morning. And so I try to just like get the big things done early in the morning. And then once I have those things done, I'll have a good meal. And so that meal will usually look like, you know, a pound, pound and a half of some sort of meat, ground beef usually. And then I'll have a, a dinner as well. That's another pound, pound and a half of some sort of protein source, whether it be chicken or low poof of chicken, low poof of pork. Uh, ground beef, some bison sometimes, and just keep it pretty simple. Like I, I really, I just like, don't try to overcomplicate it. You know, there'll be periods where I'm pretty consistently getting raw and I'll like have a significant portion of my calories for certain stints coming from raw milk, just cause I really, I handle it very well and I'm getting it from a really high quality source. I love like the hydrating benefits of having some raw milk. Um, and I'm also just a huge proponent of bone broth. I will have that weekly. I think that's just incredibly nourishing for the gut. Love the glycine benefits. So uh, I, I do try to like drink a fair share of my calories when it comes to bone broth and raw milk too. So yeah. Simple, simple, which is unsexy, but it actually works. And yeah. I'm similar to Harry as well, where it's like two big meals a day. The, I would say the, the differences that I've actually found recently in the morning, I I was just noticing that I would fast in the morning and I wouldn't break my fast until like 12 to one in the afternoon. And I actually didn't feel as great as I wanted to. So I've actually been incorporating a smaller meal in the morning, whether it's like some bone broth, maybe three eggs cooked in beef tallow. And then recently, just because we have our supplement company, I've been doing a, a cup of raw milk with like three or four egg yolks and then a scoop of the noble chocolate protein powder in there. And just putting something that's like nutrient dense and packed with protein in the morning makes me feel really good. And then at lunch, we literally keep an air fryer in the office. So I'll pull a steak out of the fridge salt it, put some pepper on there. I have a amazing steak ready to go in 10 minutes. Typically it's pretty fatty, like a ribeye or a strip. And then I really just do the same thing for dinner. And then sometimes with those, with those two meals, sometimes I am hungry for dinner. Sometimes I'm not. And I really just listen to my body and, and similar to Harry, if I can end that last meal around like six or seven o'clock, I find that I sleep better if I'm getting into bed around 10 o'clock at night. And that's the beautiful thing about this diet is when you do it long enough you start to realize, am I actually hungry or am I just kind of eating for pleasure or social conditioning, et cetera. And there are a lot of times where I'm like, I could just kind of drink a cup of bone broth with a little bit of butter blended in there and then just go to bed and I feel really good. I actually don't need to eat. It's almost like your body rewires itself from what's the maximum amount of calories that I need to live versus like, what's the minimum amount of nutrient dense calories that just make me feel really good. Yeah, it's, I, I feel the same way. When I first started, I had to track macros because I didn't eat meat for 12 years. But now I couldn't even tell you how much I eat in certain meals and days because I, I go by my hunger. And if I eat too lean, I notice I'm craving fat. So then I'll eat more fat. So I think that is the beauty of this way of eating. Have you guys noticed a difference between eating like the rainbow of meats, like the variety? And I just like that because as a nutritionist, I want to just capture all the nutrients versus just eating ruminant meat. But have you guys noticed a difference in energy, nutrition, anything by going strict ruminant versus eating like the rainbow of meats? I would say even, even as far as saying like eating more nose to tail, like when I incorporate more bone broth, more uh, bone marrow, some organ meats as well, like I notice a massive diff shift in energy levels. I, I just think like, I mean, bone marrow and organ meats, like are just packed with nutrients. So a little bit goes a long way. And then in terms of other animals, like my younger brother's a big hunter. He had some venison at one point, brought it in. It was fantastic. So, you know, I, I noticed like some, some of that game your meat that like hunted, hunted meat from wild animals. I don't know if this is like purely anecdotal, but I think there's like something to the fact that they're obviously like surviving every single day and they're not just protected by, yeah, you know, stressed. yeah, they're not stressed. They're not protected by a farmer. They're out there just living their lives. Like I, I do think it's just like a healthier animal, healthier person. So, you know, I think it's anecdotal, but you know, another example, like felt great after eating the venison. Yeah. I don't know if you had any other ones. Yeah. I find that um, when I incorporate some other animal products, like particularly chicken, pork, fish, I'm really doing that because I want variety and chicken in particular sometimes sits well. And then honestly, sometimes I don't feel like I digest it as well as I do with red meat and red meat for me is like, I know how to make it incredibly well. It's super nutrient dense. It's very nourishing. It tastes delicious every time I eat it. And I think my body is so accustomed to after five years of almost having two pounds of red meat a day for five years that it just knows what to do with that exact food group. So 
for me in particular, like I definitely feel way better with ruminant meat and I throw some lamb in there from time to time that digests really well too, but it's primarily beef products for me. Okay. No, that makes sense. You mentioned the noble product. Can you talk a little bit about it? What was the need for it and what is it exactly? Yes. Yeah, so noble, we launched noble in April this past year, and it was really on the back of having been doing the show for a year and getting a lot of feedback from our audience in terms of one, where to get, where can I get really high quality beef sources from and where can I get high quality protein? And one of the things that we really felt like there was a, a gap in the market for protein powders and there's tons of whey protein out there. There's a lot, a few beef protein isolate brands who are doing things well, but there really isn't kind of like an athletic greens model for like an animal based supplement. So really, we really felt like there's this great opportunity to have just this one scoop, simple protein powder that has everything that you need in, from a micro uh, micronutrient perspective. So our protein powder has beef protein isolate in it. It has a small amount of an organ complex collagen and colostrum. So just a great way to get additional protein into the diet. We know that a lot of kids and a lot of uh, women in particular struggle to get enough protein. So it's simple to just add into some Greek yogurt, add into a smoothie, and you can get that additional protein into your diet. So we're just really excited to bring it to market, like a, a clean protein uh, powder that can help people really start to understand too, the difference between a plant-based diet and an animal-based diet really like our brand is not going to cater to the, you know, cricket proteins and like new, you know, hemp proteins and all the different proteins that you see coming out of the grocery store. Like we really just are going to keep this a, a very simple animal-based protein brand and hopefully have some other products coming out here soon. But um, yeah, just excited to get it to market and I've been getting some great feedback on it. That's awesome. What's the difference between the whey protein and just the beef protein isolate? So the interesting thing is that whey protein is derived from the actual milk of the cow, whereas beef protein, it's been around for a long time, but I think it's starting to get more popular with trends towards carnivore diets and animal products in general. It's actually coming directly from the muscle tissue of the cow. So when you're slaughtering the animal, they essentially cook the muscle tissue down and actually turn it into a powder form. So when you're taking the protein, it's actually, it's really the muscle tissue of the cow that you're drinking versus milk of a cow, which is from whey. And the issue with a lot of whey proteins is there, there are some really good ones. There are some grass fed whey products, but um, most whey protein is coming from industrial dairies where the cows are hopped up on hormones. They're being fed corn, soy, et cetera. They're not being fed grass. And then they're processing it so many times that that's why a lot of people, when they have protein powder, they're saying, look, I want to hit my protein goals, which is why I'm drinking this, but it doesn't sit well in the gut. We've been finding with a lot of our customers and ourselves, because we were really the guinea pigs for this product, that because it's coming from the muscle tissue, it just absorbs a lot better in the stomach. And it's great for people with like GI or autoimmune issues too. No, that's fascinating. Do you, have you guys looked into uh, the levels of maybe histamines? I don't know if that, I don't think you could test for it, but some of the people, so I'll give you an example. We have clients that want to take the elemental diet, which is just, uh, you know, it's like your nutrients broken down, assimilated just to give your GI tract a rest. Could somebody use the protein powder and it doesn't have too many histaminic responses? I feel like, I wonder if we could actually test for that because I'm not sure what the histamine levels are, but that's a, that's a really interesting idea because that would let us tap into that crowd too, because people yeah. want that variety on that diet and it could work really, really well. But yeah, I think we probably have to get it tested for that too, but I think it's possible to do that. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, we could even probably test it in our practice with some of the more sensitive people. Like, can you tolerate this? Um, I know that they've tried elemental powders and they can't because there's so many fillers in the, the, you know, the other ingredient part where it's just, oh, there's tapioca starch or there's something else that's a filler that they cannot tolerate. And so I do think if you guys can magically figure out where more people can use this as even the elemental diet, it would be huge. I think personally, we have so many people in our community that can, can that cannot tolerate dairy at all, not even raw, not even the cultured ones. So where can they get this is and is it just do you recommend it once a day? Could Is it a meal replacement? It can be a meal replacement. Okay. So the interesting thing about it is that be, because it's coming from the muscle tissue of the cow, it's a little bit lower calorie, high in protein. So one scoop is 95 calories and then 25 grams of pro beef protein okay. isolate directly from the muscle tissue. So you can, like, if you wanted to go to the gym in the morning and be somewhat fasted, you could mix a scoop of it with water and it's only 95 calories, but you could totally mix it into a shake with like 
you know, some heavy cream, some raw milk, some egg yolks, whatever you want to throw into your shake. And you could get like, you could make it like 600, 700 calories and have it be more of a meal replacement. And I typically do two scoops every single morning. So I'm getting like 50 grams of protein. And that's, you know, that's a, a good starting point for a lot of people where there are definitely a lot of people that want to jump right into carnivore diet. And then there's other people where maybe their starting point is just doing a gram of protein per pound of body weight. And that's where the powders can be effective. But I think that still comes secondarily to prioritizing the food, the, the, the real food sources first, and then supplement second. I want to try it. I think my son, maybe, maybe it'll be beneficial because we don't ever buy like chocolate milk, you know? Yeah. So I know sometimes they see their friends drinking you who are the Nesquik, but they've never tried it. So it's a, uh... do your boys drink raw milk? We, I looked very di diligently for a raw milk farmer to compensate for the lack of breast milk. And so Caleb, our oldest, he's now nine. I started getting the milk when he was one. And we continued until our farmer, I don't even know if he passed away now, but he stopped about a year ago and we went even four months ago. But yeah, for that whole time, they drink a glass of raw goat's milk every single morning um, wow. and they love it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a fan. I don't like it, but they, they drink it every single morning. I feel like years. goat's milk tastes like a goat. I wish I liked it. Oh. I just <laughs> love kudos, kudos to your boys, but no, they would love it. Like a lot of our customers will give it to their kids where they won't tell their child what it is. They'll just, they'll blend some chocolate into milk and they'll give it to them and they think it's chocolate milk. So we definitely got to send you some, because I think your boys would really like it too. And then they can get the benefits of 25 grams of protein, but it tastes like chocolate milk. That's awesome. So if I were to order it, where would I go? So our website's nobleorigins.com. Okay. So you can order it there. We have chocolate and vanilla flavors. And then we also have, um, we didn't talk about this, but we have a, an organ complex that you know, if you're not the type of person who wants to be taking pills, you know, I know a lot of the organs that a lot of people get, if they can't get them fresh, they're taking it in pill form. Right. We have just a pure powdered form. Oh, so wow, you can okay. put it in smoothies, put it on ground beef. And so those are, we have three simple products, chocolate, vanilla, and then the organ complex. So yeah, available at nobleorigins.com. So wait, you put the organ complex in a drink. It doesn't taste like organs. It, it, if you make it like a smoothie, it, if you mix it with water, it's going to be pretty intense. But when okay. you mix it with a smoothie and milk, you actually can't taste it. And then we have a lot of customers that will, they'll season a steak with their spices and then they'll oh, okay. take a bit of it and throw it on their steak. And when you cook it into it, you can't taste it at all. Or like Harry said, you'll sprinkle it onto ground beef and you can kind of make it more of like an ancestral dish. And then some people will even make a protein yogurt bowl. They'll do uh, grass fed yogurt, scoop of the chocolate or vanilla, and then they'll throw some of the organs and mix it in really good. And then you can't really taste it that way either. Well, that's awesome. Coffees. Some people are putting in their coffees. Mm. I've heard, I saw someone make mashed potatoes with it. So they have like organ meat mashed potatoes. <laughs> yeah. People are getting creative. Okay. I'll have to take a look. Thank you so much. Uh, as we're wrapping up, I just want to ask a question beyond diet. What other lifestyle mindset, anything that you've learned, whether from your own journey, whether from the people that you've interviewed, what are some tools that you found are really essential to live a better life? You know, the past year for me, I've learned a lot about just like reconnecting with a higher purpose. I come back to faith in a pretty strong way. And okay. there are a lot of things that popped into my mind when you said, when you answer that, or when you ask that question, but the first thing that I could think of is just developing a spiritual practice, you know, there's a lot of things in the world today that I think uh, sort of have replaced what a God, God figure in our, our lives would be. And, you know, whether that be like our jobs or higher education or the government, like there's just a lot of things that are replacing an actual higher purpose. And and I, I think just developing a spiritual practice has allowed me to not only be a healthier version of myself and prioritize you know, my, my own self and what I can actually give to the world in terms of wanting to spread the gifts that I've been given, the God given gifts that I've been given, but also just being able to, you know, connect and, and really like, there's a lot more out there and, you know, we're all in this together and, you know, the way we treat people is really important. So um, I think it's, it's a huge leveling up tool for people, especially, I think, you know, this is our second year in business as entrepreneurs. And when you don't have that framework of like a, a big corporate job paying you money, you're out there on your own and you have to have some sort of like, you know, I, I think like some sort of structure in place 
that allows you to orient yourself. And I think, you know, coming back to Christianity for me has been important for that because I just hang my hat on the fact that I'm trying to do the best that I can every single day. You know, I measure myself against, you know, how, how I'm being viewed in God's eyes as opposed to anything else. So yeah, that's been very important for me. I love that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And it actually, it kind of tag teams what I was going to say. And I think that a lot of people might think that the carnivore diet is like the magic bullet to get yourself healthy. And I think it's a massive role. And I think there are a lot of people, I, I'm one of those people where diet was a huge lever to pull to get myself into the health that I ultimately wanted. And I think if I'm speaking candidly, there were, there were multiple other factors too. I think prioritizing, you know, meditation, prioritizing prayer, getting a lot more sunlight, walking consistently throughout the day. Like I would take 10 to 15 minute walks, sometimes longer after all my meals for digestion. I think those worked incredibly well. And then also the community aspect of it too is, is massive. I think the three of us are really fortunate where we're in this amazing city, Austin, Texas. It kind of feels like this health and wellness renaissance hub. That's that's kind of what it feels like where there's so many ranches to source meat from. There's a lot of people that are on this diet that are part of this lifestyle and I think that's also what makes it more sustainable is the people that you actually surround yourself with too, people that want to partake in this, partake in this diet and treat their health like it's really seriously, because that's that's what's going to allow you to be able to go out and share meals with them and be able to stay on track with that and keep you motivated, especially if you want to cheat and deviate. I think that's part of the issue is I think people feel like they're on an island when they're when they're part of this lifestyle. They feel like, hey, I'm the only one that's eating these foods, but I'm part of this company or this job where everyone else is just eating the standard American diet. And you know, I know that there's different lifestyle factors and costs and variables, but, you know, I would also just encourage you to find that community. Maybe it's that city, maybe it's that gym, maybe it's that church where people are more like-minded and are also on this journey. And cause that's going to give you the ultimate level of accountability too. And that's been massive in my own personal health journey is actually, you know, putting myself in the right city to kind of encourage this movement to, to grow. I love it. Thank you both for your responses. I had no idea that you would bring up faith. And that's been part of my big journey too, is as I got better from my own healing journey, just really solidifying my relationship with God has strengthened me. And I think it's partially because as an entrepreneur, it can get really hard. And then you start comparing yourself or the things that you still need to do. You can work 24 seven and it'll never be good enough. But when you view it in the world of faith, it's just, it's okay. You can kind of let go of control and you'll somehow be okay. And I think that level of peace is something that no science book, no textbook will really explain to you until you've gone through it. That spiritual journey of it's okay, still have hope. Um, the world is bad, but you can still share about me and bring hope to other people. And that's what it's all about because no amount of money or success I feel is what's going to bring happiness or joy. It's that connection. Uh, the longest Harvard study shows that it is connection. The true belief that at three in the morning, when you're really sick and you do, you have somebody that you can call. And if you do, that's a higher chance you'll live longer than any diet, any, anything that you do. And then that belief in faith that somehow whatever happens, good or bad, you'll be okay. So yeah. I love it. Yeah. Where can people find you? Where's your podcast? Is it also on YouTube, your social media? We're, we're on all the major platforms. So it's it's the Meat Mafia podcast. So we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We have a YouTube channel where we we post the video content from every single podcast that we do as well. On Twitter, I am Meat Mafia Brett. Harry is Meat Mafia Harry. So we have separate Twitter accounts. Instagram is just Meat Mafia Media. And then we also have a newsletter too that we're pumping. Yeah, so we have a, a newsletter, the Food for Thought newsletter. I can uh, share the link with you. That goes out every Friday. We report the news a little bit and then share some of our insights into, you know, what's happening in the world. And then also some, some of the things that we're working on and, and some information that we think is worth sharing. So check that out. You also do a little bit of marketing, right? So like that connector role that we we're talking about, you actually help certain brands market a little bit better too. Is that correct? Yeah, we do. And it's actually, I think it's important because especially being in this creator and health space for the last two years, I think there's a lot of Mis misconceptions around the money that you can make. And, you know, to grow a grow podcast is a really long, hard war of attrition where it takes a very long time to be able to monetize it significantly. And we both made this investment two years ago where we just said, look, we're going to quit our jobs. We're going to go all in on this. We feel like this is really, you know, our God given mission to be able yeah. to, to teach people about health. 
Um, but you also have to monetize too. And the podcast wasn't making that much money. Right. And a few of our early, some of our first sponsors of the podcast reached out to us and said, look, we've been following you on Twitter for a really long time. That was our biggest platform. We had about 130,000 followers. And they said, we've never had copywriters that really understand the brand ethos and really understand the health space the way that you're able to. Would you be willing to just run our Twitter accounts for us? So it kind of, it started off more as a way for us to make a little bit of money to support us while we were doing the podcast. And we realized that it it, it it's evolved to be so much more than that. And we always look at that, you know, that viral food web thing where it shows 10 companies that control like thousands mm -hmm. of products in the grocery store. Our agency is a way to push back against that because there are so many amazing brands that are coming out every single week that have the best products ever. But if no one knows about those products, mm -hmm. then you're going to really dilute the message. And there's only going to be so far that they can go without marketing. So we kind of view ourselves as the people that can create the right content that has the ability to go viral and get seen by more people so they can grow their customer base and really just spread awareness for a lot of these amazing products that are coming out and that exist. So, so we have this marketing agency where we run um, Twitter accounts for brands. Instagram accounts for brands. And then also we help get founders on more podcasts too, because that's such amazing unintentional marketing tool right. where if you're on the nutrition with Judy podcast and you have this great meat product and you're talking about your story, it's such an authentic experience for the listener that their likelihood to purchase and support the founder is really, really high. And you see a lot of paid ads now for brands that are literally clips of founders that are going on other podcasts and they're right. running paid ads because they do super well. So we do a number of those different things in addition to the podcast and running Noble and, you know, just feel really fortunate to be able to help promote these brands and get their message out there. It, it's literally called the Meat Mafia Agency. So oh, it's okay. very, okay. yeah. So if someone just like DMs us on Twitter and Instagram, okay. you know, we, we would be happy to talk to you and love to talk to you and learn more about what you got going on and see if we can help you. Yeah. I, I think what you're doing is so important because even us as a company, it's hard when we even if we try to get a writer or a copy editor, because they don't understand carnivore that much, it's so hard. These small nuances, they'll never understand it. And it's so frustrating. So we only hire from the carnivore community because it's so hard to have to argue the diet. And it's like, that's the fundamental mental baseline of where we practice. But not everyone is skilled with marketing. So I just think what you're doing is such a pivotal role. I always struggled with is marketing like you're just being a salesman, but it's not. If you know that these, the like the carnivore bar, if, it, if a product is good and you know that, then it's our duty to get it out there and have people have better options than what's on the grocery store shelves. So I think it's really important. Totally. Think about the the big food marketing budgets, and and I feel like that makes makes you feel better about selling these products or messages that are just you know the exact opposition of what big food is trying to push out there, and they're spending billions and billions of dollars promoting ill health through all the products that they're pushing. So yeah, the lunch school just approved Lunchables as you know a possible lunch. Somebody at my kid's school, it's a un, you know it's an unschooling school, but brought a Lunchable. And then my kids were like, I wish I could bring a Lunchable to school. And I said, I'll make a version for you, but I will never let you that. That's so processed, yeah. but it's just, that's the way the world and the marketing and all of that works in that world. And we just have to combat it. And the only way is by sharing this news and how does it get out without marketing? So, yeah, it, it comes back to what you said earlier, Judy, of like, we've just normalized things that shouldn't be normalized. So I think the statistic is that 100,000 public schools will now have Lunchables as an actual lunch option. When a, when a child goes up in line, they can literally select that as their lunch. So it's federally illegal to sell whole public schools, but you can get Lunchables, you can get pizza, you can get Cheetos. Schools, I think the New York public school districts, they do meatless Mondays and plant-based Fridays because Mayor Adams is vegan. So he's been promoting his dietary agenda on our kids. So that's why this stuff is just so fundamentally important because we think about your boys and their friends and, you know, they, they need to know that there are these better delicious options that exist. And that stuff really isn't, it's not food. It's a, it's a substance at the end of the day. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And thank you so much for all the work you do. And it was great talking to you guys. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Judy. We appreciate it. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. I hope it shares a little bit more context about our meats and where it comes from and what it really means to eat grass finished and grain finished. And it's not just about the money aspect or having pride about the types of meat you eat. I think it's more than just a simple conversation than that. 
If you haven't checked out the Meat Mafia podcast, I highly recommend it. It's a very fun podcast. They share so many different perspectives. It's more than just eating meat, but it's so fundamental in the way that they live their lives. Ultimately, I think you have to find what works for you in terms of the cuts of meat you eat, the types of meat, and know that eating this way and fueling your body the right way actually saves you a lot of money in the long run. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys.